PPE is last on the list, but extremely important in preventing hazardous exposure to employees. Hello, I'm Rachel Deer, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. This is the October 2nd update of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series. Thank you for joining us. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AAPA credit, as well as AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CE information. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the red Claim Credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. There, you will find all of our previous COVID-19 programs and have access to other free CE programs on a wide range of topics. The slides for today's webinar can be found in the resource list window. Today's learning objectives are, explain the health risks associated with occupational exposure to hazardous drugs, discuss safe handling of hazardous drug standards, and understand how to stay safe with limited PPE supply during COVID-19. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer Incorporated and in kind by DKB Med. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the activity directors, planning committee members, and faculty presenters. With us today, we have Michaela Olson, an oncology nurse specialist at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins Hospital. She will be presenting on the safe handling of hazardous drugs. Michaela, thanks for your time. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about hazardous drug handling during a pandemic. The PPE shortages that were experienced uh, across the United States in some instances led many of us that are thought leaders in the area of hazardous handling to join together and have some discussions with the Oncology Nursing Society about how to protect our members during this time. It was a very important conversation because oncology nurses give some of the most hazardous drugs that are out there. And although we were and are still very concerned about uh, infections, including COVID, we have to also uh, protect our nurses and pharmacists and other people that handle hazardous drugs. So today we're going to just have a little discussion. I'd like to think that we can also use this discussion to try to prepare for future events that may happen and, and maybe be more forward thinking when something happens again that we need to be prepared for. So the, the issue of hazardous handling is that there are numerous drugs that are considered hazardous to humans. And we give these drugs to treat people with can for cancer and many other types of um, non-malignant conditions, but the fact is that the drugs that are considered hazardous are also potentially dangerous to the healthcare workers who handle them. We know that more than 8 million healthcare workers in the United States are potentially exposed to hazardous drugs during their work, and we know that pharmacists and nurses are the most uh, exposed potentially due to the mixing and administering, which are the highest risk activities. And we know that this is not just chemotherapy. NIOSH has a list of hazardous drugs that they publish, and there's a 2021 publication probably that's going to be released soon with new updates to the hazardous drug list. But this is a list that contains not just chemotherapy drugs, but also many other types of medications uh, that are given for many different conditions. Those drugs include immune modulators and also antivirals and many other drugs that we use for non-malignant conditions. Many of these drugs are now oral. Patients may be on them for life. Uh, we give them frequently in our hospitals and in our clinics on cancer and non-cancer floors in our hospitals. We use the hazardous drugs in many non-malignant conditions, and this is growing. And there are many biologically engineered drugs that exist 
with unknown health risks. It's unlike radiation therapy, we can't monitor our exposure. And with radiation therapy, you can put a little badge on your scrubs or your jacket that will help monitor your exposure, but that's not uh, an option with hazardous drugs and there is not a permissible exposure limit. The way that we define hazardous drugs is also according to NIOSH, and any drug that exhibits at least one of the following characteristics is considered a hazardous drug. So as you can see, a drug that has genotoxicity, teratinogenicity, uh, that's carcinogenic, that has reproductive toxicities, has a structure or toxicity similar to other drugs classified as hazardous, or has organ toxicity at low doses, um, any of those criteria make the drug uh, hazardous. So this is why the list of hazardous drugs is pretty extensive. We know that there are many different types of exposure, and the most common type of exposure is uh, dermal exposure direct contact through the skin. Ingestion is another type of exposure, which is why we don't allow food or chewing gum and that we discourage hand-to-mouth contact when administering or handling hazardous drugs. We know that inhalation can occur through aerosols, through dust or vapors, and we know that we can have increased exposure risk through injection if we should have sharps or a needle stick or a breakage of glass that is containing a hazardous drug. By far the most common source of exposure now is through dermal contact and we believe that is through a lot of the dermal exposure is from uh, environmental contamination of hazardous drug. If we don't contain the drug and keep it from exposing areas that we work in, uh, prevent drippage, prevent leakage, prevent aerosolization, then it actually gets on surfaces in the environment, then people can touch those surfaces and have dermal exposure. So wearing our PPE, personal protective equipment, and having the proper procedures in place for handling hazardous drugs will help decrease the risk of contamination of the environment, which actually causes that dermal exposure. And as we know, dermal exposure can cause employees to have hazardous drug health risks we know that dermal exposure is a very common thing in environments where hazardous drugs are given. And every step of the way to try to minimize that exposure is, is really important. These are some of the adverse effects of hazardous drug exposure. There are many acute toxicities, acute symptoms as a result of exposure to hazardous drugs. And you can see those listed on the left everything from some ocular irritation, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, all the way to thinning of hair, mouth and nasal sores, um, dermatitis, dizziness and headaches, um, numbness in the fingertips, numbness in the lips. These are all types of acute exposure that can happen from hazardous drugs. We also know that it's been well studied that uh, many of the hazardous drugs can have reproductive toxicities. Some of the chemotherapy drugs that we give actually can cause um, learning disabilities in offspring, low birth weight babies, spontaneous abortions, miscarriages, and stillbirths. And we also are learning more and more about biologic changes uh, from genetic damage and an increased risk of cancer in people that handle hazardous drugs, um, most notably the human carcinogens. So it's easy to understand why that even during a pandemic, why we need to understand the seriousness of handling hazardous drugs and to convince people that we work with in other departments, uh, such as those that work in um, procuring PPE in our products uh, committees or other areas that the type of PPE that we use for handling hazardous drugs is extremely important. And while we're concerned about COVID and infection, we have to make sure that we maintain proper PPE for hazardous drugs. There is a hierarchy of controls for how we deal with hazardous drugs. Um, the first and the most effective is to eliminate the hazardous drug. We know that during a pandemic or at any other time, we cannot eliminate the use of chemotherapy 
or other hazardous drugs. Our patients need to continue their treatment during this time, and so that's not an option. We can't substitute the drugs in most cases. The next best thing we have available is called engineering controls. And engineering controls include things like a biologic safety cabinet in the pharmacy or items, uh, engineering controls called closed system transfer devices, which are used when preparing and administering chemotherapy to prevent the drug from escaping and to prevent anything from getting in the drug. So closed system transfer devices are engineering controls that are highly effective in preventing staph exposure and need to be used at all times, especially during times that when our PPE is limited to prevent uh, healthcare worker exposure. The next thing that we put in place in the hierarchy of controls is administrative controls. Those are your policies and procedures, changing the way people work, having rules about chain of custody of the drug so that we don't have exposure. And then finally, PPE. Uh, PPE is last on the list, but extremely important in preventing hazardous exposure to employees. And so the use of all of these things together, the engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE is highly important for protecting employees. I just wanted to mention USP 800, which is a new standard, not a guideline, that was published in 2016 that is going to become official in probably the next 12 months or so. And we are all anxiously awaiting these new standards, which are a companion to the USP 797 sterile compounding guidelines or standards, I should say. And these standards really focus on protection of the employee when handling hazardous drugs. These standards do require the use of closed system transfer devices when administering hazardous drugs. And they also require certain uh, personal protective equipment to be used with, ha with hazardous drugs. We know that all PPE is not the same. All PPE is not protective when handling hazardous drugs. So it's not so easy as just saying, well, we're out of our gowns, so, that, so we're going to just substitute some other product because it may provide no protection for the employee. It's really important that we look at what kind of personal protective equipment we have, that we try to preserve the PPE as much as possible for the use with hazardous drugs the specific PPE that has been tested for use with hazardous drugs, and that we use other types of PPE for COVID or other infections. A process for deciding how you're going to use your PPE is very important. So let's just talk a little bit about what is required, and then we'll talk about some interim guidelines that came out through the Oncology Nursing Society through the COVID-19 pandemic and how we, so, we sort of made decisions to protect ourselves and maintain safety while giving hazardous drugs during this very difficult time. So the personal protective equipment that is required when you handle hazardous drugs is, is gloves, of course. Double gloves is recommended. And the reason for that is you have a double second layer of protection to prevent dermal exposure. But also when what we do is we teach when you're handling hazardous drugs, after you hang the hazardous drug or administer the hazardous drug, you're to remove the outer gloves before you move on and do anything where you program the pump or touch something else. The whole purpose of that is to prevent environmental contamination. Powder-free gloves are recommended and the gloves that are most effective are latex, nitrile, or neoprene. Because of latex allergies, we primarily use the latter two types of gloves for chemotherapy or other hazardous drug administration. The gloves that are chosen and used should be tested for use with chemotherapy. And I know what's happened um, during the pandemic is that gloves have been difficult to obtain for some, gowns have been difficult to obtain, but there are many types of these products. So finding out which ones have been tested for use with hazardous drug, and then taking those and keeping them and preserving them for hazardous drug use is very important. And that needs to be thought about right up front so that you don't 
use those higher level gowns and gloves for infection and then run out of them for hazardous drug use. For gowns, again, tested for use with hazardous drug is an important component. Um, they have to be polyethylene coated or made of other laminate material. Disposable, the disposable is really key because during this time, some manufacturers uh, brought back cloth gowns and cloth reusable gowns that are sent to be laundered are very helpful for prevention of infection and transmission of infection and can be effective, but they are not and have not been tested for use with hazardous drugs and so are not recommended. The disposable single-use gowns is what the national standards and guidelines recommend prior to the COVID pandemic, and we'll talk a little bit about the interim guidelines next. The gowns should be closed cuffed, elastic, or knit cuffs. They should have a back closure. They should not be cloth, and surgical scrubs are not appropriate. Face and eye protection should be used when spilling or splashing is possible. The nice thing about the current state is that most everybody's already in a mask and a face shield, so they are protected from uh, hazardous drug exposure. And then respirators are recommended when you're dealing with aerosols or spills, and that would be a chemical cartridge type respirator or a PAPR, which we are already using in our biocontainment areas. During the pandemic, myself and the other editor to the hazardous drug handling guidelines and the Oncology Nursing Society leaders decided to quickly get a handle on this and write some interim guidelines for our membership. The interim guidelines said that for gowns, um, we still recommend a disposable poly-coated gown. A regular disposable gown that's water resistant could be used next. And that we should preserve cloth gowns that are facility laundered for infection control and non-hazardous drug activities. So really um, recommending to preserve those disposable poly-coated gowns for the hazardous drug use and go quickly to cloth gowns if there was a shortage for all other uh, activities. For masks, ONS recommended mask and eye and face protection when there's a risk of spilling or splashing and for when cleaning up spills, reserving an N95 mask for symptomatic or COVID positive patients for hazardous drug spills and for cleanup. And that PAPRs could be used. PAPR is a powered air purifying respirator that could also be used for cleaning up a spill or an activity where there would be hazardous drug exposure. Eye protection, ONS recommends mask with eye protection or goggles if splashing is likely or you're cleaning up a spill and also the use of a pepper. For gloves, the recommendation is to use the double chemotherapy tested gloves. The interim guidelines said that if there was a severe shortage of gloves that we could use a single chemotherapy tested glove but we would have to be very cautious about touching things after handling hazardous drug, remove those gloves and wash the hands with soap and water before touching anything else to prevent that environmental contamination. If the single chemotherapy tested glove was on shortage and we were no longer able to obtain them, then the next best thing would be a double standard exam glove that was not tested for use with hazardous drug because that would be all we would have available. And if we were having a shortage of standard exam gloves and needed to preserve them, then obviously a single standard exam glove would be necessary to use. And luckily, at least in my institution, we did not have a problem with our gloves and we were able to maintain the chemo tested gloves. The Oncology Nursing Society interim guidelines also stated that uh, we could preserve our PPE for hazardous handling for the table one NIOSH drugs. So there are three different categories of hazardous drugs in the NIOSH guidelines. Table one are the antineoplastics primarily. So they are the most dangerous drugs to handle and many of them are human carcinogens. The interim guidelines said that if you did not have a choice and you were really running out of all PPE, that you could reserve the PPE that was for hazardous drug handling for just the table one NIOSH drugs. 
They also said you could use one polycoated gown to hang or take down chemo with the double chemotherapy tested gloves. And what, what I mean by that, I said in the previous slides that you use a polycoated gown, it should be disposable, and it's generally a one-time use. And we're very strict about that because in our normal standard guidelines, because when you take off the gown and reapply it, you have a risk of contamination if you reuse it. However, we knew that with the pandemic, we, we had to make some allowances for the shortages that we may face. So by using a hook or something that was near the patient, you could very carefully put on the gown, hang up the chemo, and then for that one employee, for that takedown of that same chemo for that same patient, you could put that gown back on, being careful not to contaminate your clothing, and then that way you would use less gowns. This will obviously not be a continued recommendation. It was just an interim guideline in the event that you ran out of or were low on these types of gowns. One gown for one patient and one nurse performing all the takedowns of chemotherapy could be another option to help consolidate activities and use less PPE, but have the right PPE for the right activity. And then using gloves only and no gown for lower risk drugs. So some of the drugs in the table two and three category, which are not carcinogenic, preserving the gowns for the human carcinogens in table one. And these are some of the resources um, that were used for this presentation and that can be used in planning for future problems with PPE related to hazardous drugs. In conclusion, it's just really important as I said, to have the right PPE for the right activity and to begin early on preserving the PPE for these activities so that you don't run out and then have to use suboptimal um, PPE. We keep in mind that we have nurses that are pregnant, breastfeeding, working in the environment where other hazardous drugs are given, even if those employees are not actually giving the hazardous drugs themselves, if they are working in that environment and the PPE is not properly initiated or there are shortcuts taken, the environment can be contaminated and then those employees can have dermal exposure and put their unborn child or their child that's breastfeeding at risk. So it takes a village, it takes all of us to care about this topic and to work ahead um, before we have substantial shortages so that we have the right PPE for our staff. And I think knowing this and just being educated about it will really help us prepare for the future. So now I'd like to go over a couple questions. When PPE becomes limited or scarce, what strategies can be implemented to maintain safety for healthcare workers who can handle hazardous drugs? So I hope I answered that, And but just to review, preserving the types of PPE that I described right up front before the PPE is, is becoming limited or scarce. In my institution, we chose the gowns and the gloves and the PPE that was, because we give so many hazardous drugs across the entire institution, we chose all of our gowns and gloves to be used for hazardous drugs so that the employee wouldn't have to decide, oh, I'm about to give a hazardous drug, I think I'm gonna have to get this pair of gloves or I'm gonna give chemotherapy, so I have to get this specific gown. We actually were able to choose one gown and one set of gloves for the entire institution that provides protection no matter if we're giving hazardous drugs or if we're dealing with an infectious problem. In that instance, if we take those gowns and gloves that we used to use housewide and preserve them for the hazardous drug exposure and handling, and then bring in separate equipment for the infectious reasons, then we are able to preserve it. So that's one strategy. Using one gown and reusing that one gown for that patient, consolidating activities, and as we do all of these things, just being mindful of prevention of environmental exposure. How is PPE protection for handling hazardous drugs different from PPE protection used for infectious agents? Well, that's actually a, a really great question and one that I didn't specifically cover, but hazardous drugs are known to permeate through material. And so our gloves are 
tested according to ASTM guidelines, and it's all about the time that it takes the drug to basically eat through the glove or permeate the glove. And in order to be approved for chemotherapy usage, gowns and gloves have to be tested for use with chemotherapy. And it's all about that permeability time. We know that in nursing, we handle these drugs for not much longer than about 30 minutes each time we go ahead and hang a chemotherapy drug or administer a chemotherapy drug and then we're taking the, the PPE off. So we want to make sure that the drugs do not permeate through the gowns and the gloves any sooner than a 30 minute time period. And the same thing for the gowns. Now the issue with the gowns is that if you have a cloth gown and that gown might be coated with something, but as it gets laundered over time, the gown becomes more permeable it's very difficult to determine how many washes before that gown becomes permeable or starts to fray or starts to get holes in it. And then that would put the employee at risk. So that's one of the reasons why we recommend a disposable poly-coated uh, impermeable gown for hazardous drug handling. These cloth gowns can be monitored and used more safely in isolation rooms instead of for use with drugs that can actually permeate through the gown and get on the employee's skin. So I hope today's presentation has given you an appreciation for the hazards of these drugs and the importance of protecting our healthcare workers uh, at all times um, and even during a pandemic. It's really important that we ensure that we're not putting people at risk for long-term toxicities from hazardous drugs um, during a pandemic and that we continue to protect our employees at all times. Michaela, thank you so much for that useful information. If you're tuning into our webcast, as a reminder, to claim credit, please click the red Claim Credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. You'll receive your certificate immediately after. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. To submit questions, please send them to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q is in question, A is in answer, at dkbmed.com. Again, thanks for joining us and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19.